All right, y'all. Well, let's go ahead and grab our Bibles. We're going to turn to Hosea chapter 1. Hosea chapter 1. Feel free to turn to your Bible index if necessary. Otherwise, the scripture will be with you up on the screen. And we're going to be reading from Hosea chapter 1, verse 2, all the way to chapter 2, verse 1. Here's what the passage says. It says, When the Lord first spoke to Hosea, he said to him this, Go and marry a woman of promiscuity. And have children promiscuity, for the land is committing blatant acts of promiscuity by abandoning the Lord. So he went and married Gomer, daughter of Diblam, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to him, name him Jezreel, for in a little while I will bring the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu and put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. On that day I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. She conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. And the Lord said to him, Name her Lo Ramah, for I will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel. I will certainly take them away, but I will have compassion on the house of Judah, and I will deliver them by the Lord their God. I will not deliver them by bow, sword, or war, or by horses and cavalry. After Gomer had weaned Lo Ramah, she conceived and gave birth to a son, and the Lord said, Name him Lo Ami, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. Yet the number of the Israelites will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or counted. And in the place where they were told, You are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. And the Judeans and the Israelites will be gathered together. They will appoint for themselves a single ruler and go up from the land. For the day of Jezreel will be great. Call your brothers my people and your sisters compassion. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Well, today I want to talk about a word. I want to talk about a word that maybe we don't talk much about. You see, because today we're going to talk about the suffering of God. This word oftentimes doesn't come up in church talk. As I've noticed lately, oftentimes when we come to church, what we end up hearing is a message about you. End up hearing a message about how you can fulfill your potential, how you can fulfill your destiny, how God has good and great plans for your life. And so often what we end up coming into church talking about is you, is about people. When in reality, what the Bible invites us to see is to invite us to see God as he is revealed to us. You see, God, it's like when we turn up our understanding of God, it's like turning up a dimmer switch where only when we view God rightly are we able to see everything else rightly. And so I want to talk about who God is and what he's doing in the world today because as we turn to the book of Hosea, we see this language, this emotion of God. And in this way, if you're anything like me, it feels a little bit uncomfortable It feels a little bit awkward as you read through Hosea and you wonder how in the world and what in the world is God trying to say to us as he used this very dramatic language, this emotional language. But today, what we recognize is that the text illuminates the heart of God, the emotional light of God, as we begin to see him as he is. And so as we come into this passage, we recognize it has a context, which is in the relationship between the covenant people of God of Israel and God himself. And so what happened is that God came and by his own grace established a covenant with Abraham. And from Abraham came a group of people called the nation of Israel. And there was a covenant relationship. Now covenant maybe isn't something that we use very often here today in these kind of terms. But this idea is that there is a relationship that has commitments. It's a relationship that has promises. And so the expectation was that both God and the nation of Israel would come into this relationship fulfilling their covenant commitments, fulfilling their relationship promises to one another. Likely probably the the space where we would be able to see this most clearly today is in a marriage relationship, a marriage covenant. Because we understand that marriage isn't simply a way to get tax breaks, right? We understand that it's not just kind of this way before the government. But marriage is actually a covenant commitment between us and God with an understanding that we have expectations and promises for the one that we would call our spouse. We use these promises like we would remain faithful to our marriage for 
forsaking all others, in fidelity, in sickness and in health, in richer and in poorer, until death do us part. And for some of us, we say amen, and we think and dream about murdering our spouse because we see that day some way in the future. But we see that covenant is a commitment to one another with expectations and promises. And so as we look at the prophets, what these prophets are doing is that in many ways they are covenant lawyers, that they're looking back and forth between the covenant that the nation of Israel had with God, and they're looking at the promises made, and they're looking at Israel, and they're looking at God, and they're looking at Israel, and they're looking at God, and they're realizing that these things don't line up. Israel is not measuring up to its commitment to God. And because of that, Israel is threatened with disconnection from God himself. They're threatened with separation, not just from life, as if life exists outside of God, but separated from the source of life, which is God himself, because all life flows from God. And so there is this problem that the nation of Israel has, which is that they are starting to separate themselves from the covenant community of God. And we see that Hosea comes and he gives a sign message. And uh, we see these weird sign messages throughout the prophets as you read them. You read and you see like Isaiah burying a pair of underwear and then going and like digging them back up. We see Ezekiel laying on his side and like cooking on excrement. We see these weird sign messages. And Hosea also has a sign message for the nation of Israel. This is a physical embodiment of a message that God wants to bring to his people. And so what God tells Hosea is to go marry a woman of promiscuity. Now the CSB puts it very lightly. You can go look up some other Bible translations to see what it would look like a little bit more forcefully and raw according to the original Hebrew, but he calls Hosea to go and to marry this woman, a woman that will become a prostitute, a woman who uh, will marry and make money off of her lifestyle. And not only that, but we see that Hosea is then called to have children with this woman whose name is Gomer. And, and this is the interesting because scholars debate about what's happening here. The first child that Hosea bears with Gomer, here's how it is described. It says she conceived and bore him a son. The next two children that Gomer bears, here's how the text describes it. The text describes it, she conceived again, which gives rise to the question of were these next two children even Hosea's? And so you can imagine the inner turmoil that Hosea is going through as he has married a woman, as he has a covenant commitment to her, as he has committed himself to her and to her children, and yet over and over again, this woman steps out of their relationship to go to other Men And God says to the nation of Israel, this is what you're doing to me. He's speaking of the poignant sting of infidelity as this wife has stepped out on her husband. And in that same way, Israel has abandoned their covenant commitment to the Lord. In the same way, Israel, instead of trusting in God for their, uh, for their victory, they end up going and making alliances with other countries for their stability instead of trusting in God. Instead of trusting in God for fertility, they end up going to Baal, to a different false god, and going through these rituals. And over and over again, the people have abandoned God. These are the people that God loved, as we see from Exodus chapter 19, verse 5. He says, now therefore... If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the people, for all the earth is mine. These aren't just simply people that God says, yeah, sure, I'll take you or leave you. These are the people that are God's treasured possession. And it's easy for us to just simply think that God is up there doing his thing and we're down here doing our thing and they don't really meet, that God is really not very emotional about our commitment to him. But what we recognize in this passage is the emotion of God toward his people. Here's how God describes it as he names these three different children. Name him Jezreel, for in a little while I will bring bloodshed on Jezreel. 
Name her Lo Rahama, for I will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel. Name him Lo Ami, for you are not my people, and I will no longer be your God. And it can almost feel like in this moment, there's a like, that was them, and this is us kind of moment. You know, like we look back at what Israel is doing and we're like, I would never do that sort of thing. I would, I would never chase after other gods or like make something with my own hands and then trust in that thing for my stability and security. I would never put my life and my desire toward money or toward security or toward the government. I would never do something like that. That was them, but now, and yet what the text does is it traps us because it shows us that not only did they break the covenant, but we have broken the covenant with God as well. That we are all trapped under the same reality. As Romans 3, Paul says this, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is no righteous person, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks out God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their path, and they have not known the way of peace. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And so we are all trapped in a problem that every one of us at some point has fallen short of the perfect law of God. And because of that, we deserve exactly what the Israelites deserved, which was bloodshed, we deserve death, which is no compassion, we deserve wrath, and no covenant, we deserve separation from all that which is good. And I think that sometimes we think that like if we were to stand before God and, you know, someday if we're going to give an account, if we were to say, well, God would say, well, why should I, you know, allow you into relationship with me in my covenant kingdom? That sometimes we take it very easy. We just say, well, listen, you know, look at how much good I've done in my life compared to how much bad. You know, if you just take that and you look at that God, then you'll see that I'm a pretty good person to which I would ask you, would it be right for a judge when somebody's standing in front of them for murder would it be right when they say, well, listen, I paid my taxes, so I'm a pretty good person. You should let me off the hook. That you would say that is not righteous if the judge would say, oh, you're fine. And how much more so for the infinite God of justice who looks at you and understands that because you've broken covenant with him, you deserve nothing but punishment. And so we see from the book of Hosea, this is some of the descriptions of what God is saying that he will do. He said, I'll let her die of thirst. I'll expose her shame. I'll punish them for their ways. I'll pour out my fury on them like water. I will tear them to pieces. And I don't know if you're feeling a little bit uncomfortable right now and shifty in your seats, but I know that I am because I begin to wonder, well, listen, if we're all in trouble because we've broken covenant commitment to God, and if we all deserve the same bloodshed and separation that the nation of Israel did, then what should we do? To which I would say, let's come back to our word that we were going to talk about at the beginning. You see, the idea of there being an AED nearby, you know, a, one of those devices you shock somebody and, you know, it's supposed to start their heart again, that you might be in a mall and have an AED nearby. And it's not good news until there's somebody that you love who needs it. And so it is sometimes that we realize that the law needs to come in to show us that we can't fulfill the law, to show us that we have no hope according to the law and that there is no good thing that comes from inside of us. And so God steps in, and we look at this one theological term called immutability. Immutability. To be mutable is to be able to change, and so immutable is the inability to change. And that might not seem like good news on the surface. You might be saying, well, why are you bringing the theological concept of immutability? Why aren't we talking about how I could be a good leader? Why aren't we talking about how I could have a better house? Why aren't we talking about how I could do better with my family or make more money? Well, because that is not your problem. The problem is, how can we be right before God? And immutability is good news when we understand it. Because if God changed, the character of God changed, we would be in trouble. Because in the moment that the character of God changed then we would no longer have hope because in your covenant unfaithfulness, it would change God so that he would say, listen, you're just in trouble now. I've changed. My grace is no longer there. My mercy is no longer available. My love is no longer available. And in that, he would leave us in our sins. 
But we see that God's immutability is the absolute perfect consistency of his character in his actual relationships throughout history with his finite creation. Now, again, this might not seem good, but let's just go ahead and explain this one more time. So immutability is the inability to change. As we look at marriages, we look at mutable people. And so oftentimes, kind of this is the description that sometimes I hear as I'm doing marriage counseling. We fell out of love with one another. You know, somehow we just drifted apart. Somewhere along the line, we didn't really like each other anymore. And because of that, we see that that love is mutable. It's changing. And that is bad news because that means that our relationship can change. But in our relationship with God, the immutability of God means that God cannot change, which is good news because it means that the love of God does not change even in the midst of our unfaithfulness and in our failing. And what that means is that God, in his immutability, loves absolutely. That you think that you love. You think that, I I think when I look at my daughter and my son, and I think when I look at my wife that I know what love is, but my love is mutable. It's changeable. There are moments that I look at the things that I do, and I say, boy, that is changing. But when we look at the infinite love of God, it is unchangeable. And what that means is that God does not leave us or forsake us in our sins, but instead reaches to us in his love. And in that, we see a God who suffers. You see, we actually see a God who suffers through the book of Hosea because it doesn't describe Hosea's emotions toward what happened to his wife. It describes God's emotions when we forsake him. And in those emotions, he suffers loss. As we talk about this idea of God's emotions, there's one theologian by the name of Henry Nouwen who writes a book on the prodigal son. And he talks about this son who has left the father. And here's how he describes it. He says, it's precisely the immensity of the divine love that is the source of the divine suffering. As father, he wants his children to be free, free to love. That freedom includes the possibility of their leaving home, going to a distant country and losing everything. The father's heart knows all the pain that will come from that choice, but his love makes him powerless to prevent it. As the father, he desires that those who stay at his home enjoy his presence and experience his affection. But here again, we, he wants only to offer a love that can be freely received. And here we see that the father suffers because of our sin, that God suffers because of our sin in the same way that a father suffers at the loss of a child. In the same way that a spouse suffers at the loss of their spouse, that's the way that God suffers for us. And in this, we see the representation in Hosea of God's suffering. You see, the idea of God's immutability would not be good news if it wasn't a part of God's moral character to bring about redemption. Because if it wasn't, then we would just be stuck in sin. We'd be like, well, the bad news is God is just, and if that's the case, then we're all gonna be punished, end of story, period, at the end of the sentence. But here's what we see, even as God is talking to Hosea, that he talks about how they won't be this people. He talks about how they will experience bloodshed. But then, verse 10, gives a message of hope. He says, yet the number of the Israelites will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or counted. And in the place where they were told, you are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. And the Judeans and the Israelites will be gathered together. They will appoint for themselves a single ruler and go up from the land for the day of Jezreel will be great. Call your brother my people and your sisters compassion. And here we begin to see not only that God suffers because of our sin, but here we see that God suffered to secure us from sin. That the question is, how is it possible that we might experience redemption when we've broken covenant? And can I tell you, it's not from our side of the equation that we somehow make it up. It's because of God's immutable love that in the midst of our lack, in the midst of our despair, he meets us in that moment with his love so that we might experience redemption, the forgiveness of sins. God suffered to secure us from sin by himself. And it's there that God's immutability leads us to a Roman cross. God's immutability of love leads us to a tomb once filled and now abandoned. God's immutability leads us to a mediator between God and humanity. As we see in Hosea 11, 14, God promises, I will ransom them from the power of Sheol. I will redeem them from death. Death, where are your barbs? Sheol, where is your sting? And this is the good news. Not that you're unchanging, but that God is unchanging. 
Because sometimes we think in our mind, well, in order for me to be approved before God, I need to be unchanging. I need to be secure. I need to be steadfast. I need to be stable. I need to not be depressed. I need to not be anxious. But the moment that we do that, we miss out on the fact of the gospel, which is that we've already messed it up. And it's not about our being unchanging. It's about God being unchanging. And in the midst of our sin and desperation, he steps in with the gospel. And it's in that very moment that we see uh, Romans say this, but God proves his own love for us in that we, when we are still sinners, Christ died for us. In the moment when you were at your lowest is the moment when God died for you. At the moment when you had nothing together was the moment when God died for you. In the moment when you broke the covenant was the moment when God died for you, not because of something that you did that he saw good in you, but simply because of the goodness and grace found in Jesus Christ. And it's because of immutability that we have hope today. As the eternal word of the Father takes flesh upon himself and he descends to us, and not only to descend to us, but descend into the grave to overcome it for us. And so what I want to preach today is that you might give up in your faith in your own constancy. That you might give up in faith in your own ability. That you might give up faith in your own ability to withstand the covenant obligations. And that you might instead turn to that which comes from outside of you. The gospel says, not because of what came from inside of you, of your own faithfulness or stability, but from the gospel that comes from outside of you, that God met you when you were undeserving. God met you when you had nothing. God met you when you were desperate. And it's in the unchangeable love of God that we see that, yes, there was a tsunami of human evil that met Jesus on the cross, but that tsunami could not be overcome by the infinite mercy and grace of God. And it's there that we celebrate the immu immutability of God, to recognize that his love never changes, to recognize that sometimes we think that he's like us and we say, well, I messed up this week. Didn't you see when I didn't have faith? I messed up this week. Didn't you see when I sinned? I messed up this week. Didn't you see when I was anxious? I messed up this week. Didn't you see when I didn't measure up? And along the way, we begin to think that because God we think is like us, we miss the point that God is nothing like us. And he says, yes, you did mess up. Yes, you did fail. Yes, you did fall. And I got to tell you, that's no surprise to me, God says. I came to you from the outside offering redemption through Jesus Christ. And so I knew that would happen and I still met you in your sin. And it's only there that we begin to run to God rather than running away from God because we recognize it's not based on our character, but it's based on God's constancy. And it's there that we come to Jesus Christ over and over again saying, I need him because I recognize in him is the fulfillment of righteousness. You see, God lets himself be pushed out of the world onto a cross. He allows himself to the place of weakness and suffering and it's there that he meets us in the midst of our weakness and suffering because we see that God suffered to secure us from our sin. We see in this moment in the Gospel of John where he writes this, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. I want to say, having loved those who are in the world, he loved them till they messed up. He loved them till they failed. He loved them till they broke covenant. He loved them till they looked at something they shouldn't have looked at. He loved them till they gossiped when they shouldn't have. He loved them till they didn't have faith. But what we see in scripture is he loved them to the end. And it's in that that we have hope. For those of you who think you don't measure up, you don't. And yet we see the love of Christ in us is the same yesterday, today, and forever. For those of you who think you're too messed up, you are. But yet his love for us in Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. For those of you who think that you're too far gone, you are. But yet the love of God in Christ for us is the same yesterday, today, and forever. For those who feel like there are conditions placed on being lovable, there are not. See the love of Christ that our place is given to us yesterday, today, and forever. For those of us who have a sneaking suspicion that God's patience is wearing thin, See instead that his love in Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. For those of us who feel like God is looking at us and says, again? Really? 
May we turn to Christ and recognize that his love is the same yesterday, today, and forever. For those who are changing and wandering and unfaithful, see that his love for us in Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it is not because of anything from inside of us. If you hear preaching that says, you're a good person, you're worthy, you did something right, then run away from that pastor because you are not. You had nothing, and that is good news, because in the midst of our nothing, God gave us everything in Jesus. Christ. And so now we say, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling because of the goodness and grace of Jesus Christ and because of the immutable nature of God's love that it will never fail in reaching you to the lowest place that you will descend. God will still find you there. And that is good news. And so we see that Jesus suffers for us so that we might be rescued from sin. But it doesn't stop there. We see the church then is called to share in God's suffering for the world. Now, I'm good up until that point. I'm like, good, because the law for me is bad news. I don't fulfill it. The gospel for me is good news because in Jesus Christ, it's fulfilled. But then you say to me, so the church is called to suffer for the world. And I'm like, whoa, now, I thought I got all the good stuff. I thought all I needed to do was like experience joy and peace. And who said I needed to suffer? And yet we see that the church is called to suffer for the world because we come alongside Jesus and we experience the same suffering as we watch those who are separated from God. You see, if the church just simply does it in and of our own selves, then we will find our own suffering to be burdensome and bothersome. You see, if we begin to say, well, listen, the way that God is happy with you as a Christian is that you suffer alongside of him, then we've made a new law. And the moment that we do that, it becomes a burden that we cannot fulfill. And so for some of us, we've been trying to love because somebody said, you need to love. Some of us, we've been trying to forgive because somebody said, you need to forgive. And that's the way that God's happy with you. But if we live according to that way, it will become a burden and we will be crushed underneath the new law that we've created. We recognize that if we try to do it on our own, then it will be a burden. For some of us, it's become bothersome to love other people. It's been bothersome to suffer for other people. Can I be honest? For all of us, at least for me, I'll speak for myself. It's bothersome for me to have to suffer for somebody else. I don't want to have to do that. And if I do it out of my own flesh, out of my own ability, I will not suffer. But that is the gospel that says not only does Christ meet you in the midst of your sin and redeem you, but then he says you are mine. You will be a new creation, that the Spirit will fill you and indwell you so that now you want to do the things that you didn't want to do before. And now the same nature that is in Christ is in you that you too might experience the love for a world that desperately needs it. And so there the church is called to suffer in the world. Suffering for the world means loving while being unloved. It means forgiving before being forgiven. It means lavish generosity that's met with, with radical stinginess. It means compassion rather than judgment. It means truth rather than tolerance. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a theologian, says the church is only the church when it exists for others. And when the church exists for others, we step into suffering, not to try to be right before God, but because God has given us a new heart. And now he says, you have my heart, you can suffer as I suffered in the world. And now his commands are not burdensome or bothersome. Now they are a delight as he lives his life through the church. And so today I want to take a moment to recognize the beauty of communion together, of the Lord's Supper. In the Lord's Supper we recognize the immutability of God, that he didn't leave us or forsake us, that though we broke covenant commitment with him, he prepared the way and then he himself fulfilled the way in Jesus Christ, that Jesus is righteous in ways that we could never be. And so now in Christ, he has prepared the way based on his own character of love and consistency so that now those of us who partake in Jesus Christ partake in the life of God itself. And so in communion, we recognize the love of God for us in Christ. And in communion, we pray that the same heart that he has, that suffered with us in our sin, that had long suffering and that came alongside of us, though we had nothing, that that same character might be formed in us, that we might say, yet not I, but through Christ in me. And so for some of us today, we're going to come to the table. And as we do, we say, God, I can't suffer for my spouse the way that you want me to. 
God, I can't suffer for my kids the way that you want me to. I can't suffer for my coworker in the way that you want me to. I can't suffer for the world in the way that you want me to by myself. I need to be filled with the spirit of God and empowered to be able to live in a new way that I might be able to live not through me, but through Christ in me, that we approach the table in faith and say, what I cannot do from the inside of me, I receive from the outside of me from the good news that comes from the outside and that meets me in the midst of my need. And from that, by the power of the Holy Spirit becomes good news in me as then this power of the Holy Spirit flows out as we suffer for one another. I wish almost that sometimes we could come to church and that we could say, welcome to church. Are you ready to suffer? (laughs) Because that's the reality. As we're in relationship with one another, It's suffering because we're imperfect and we're messy and we break relationship and we ruin things and we destroy things. But in the church, the reason that we come together is because we've been founded on Jesus Christ. And so now we suffer alongside one another and with one another because Christ himself has suffered for us. And now we meet the other in love because of what Christ has done for us. And so there we meet the suffering God in the midst of our own suffering as we ask him to fill us with himself because there is no other way for us to be able to do it. Would you stand with me together today? Lord, I ask that we would despair of ourselves, that we would recognize that we are covenant breakers And that as covenant breakers, we deserve nothing but separation from the God of love and of life. Lord, I pray that in the midst of that desperation, that then you would turn our eyes to heaven. That we would recognize the character of God, the consistency of God, that you do not change. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And in that, you're the same in love that you met us in the midst of our need by Jesus Christ and that he fulfilled the perfect law of love that now we might be able to live in faith in him in community and relationship with you and with one another. Would you allow us to always look to Jesus, to recognize that those of us who are changing in our character have no hope to look inward, but must look outward at Jesus who is unchanging and who he himself fulfills the perfect law of love. And in that we receive of Christ himself and partake in his presence in our lives through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. And in that may you form in us a community that suffers with one another, that suffers for one another, and that displays in the moments as we come alongside each other, the love of Jesus Christ, as we desperately need you. Lord, I pray that as we partake in the Lord's Supper today, that we would partake in faith, in recognition of the work that you have done, in recognition that we desperately need you, and that, Lord, it's only by your mercy and your grace meeting us from outside that allows us to live in a new way. We thank you, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.